So, hi everyone uh, and welcome to another session of Equality Intervention Series brought to you by Talis and dedicated members of GOP and DPO. We have a very special guest from San Diego, Dr. Carla Peña. Um, Vasconcelos, I hope I pronounced that uh, correctly, who is an academic and, act and an activist with an international background in education and community service. Carla's work uh, focuses on promoting intersectional justice through both her research and practice. She's collaborating uh, in, with universities, nonprofits and social movements across the globe, including Spain, Brazil and the United States. She's also a dedicated board member of the North County San Diego Women's March, women spe uh, spelt as X, with X advocating for reproductive justice. Her work brings the community together in collaborative leadership practices for civic education and social engagement, fostering brave and supportive spaces for all women identifying trans, non-binary, LGBTQI+, and other community members. Carla is also a long-standing member of GOP, who regularly contributes gendered and feminist practices into the community's discussions. So it is no wonder at all that we are very pleased to host her today and engage with her research. And on this occasion, and to our delight, Carla will talk to us about how women can gain ground in predominantly masculine and masculinized domain of formal politics and governance by exploring the case study of Juntas, a feminist collective which held office uh, in Brazil between 2018 and, and 2022. So with this delicious teaser, and without further ado, over to you, Carla. Thank you. Thank you, Nella. Thank you so much for being here. First of all, I appreciate the space uh, that the, the, the organization of gender organizational practice research clusters is offering for sharing this, uh, this piece, this, uh, this opinion paper, which uh, um, is impressed to be published by the Leadership Stage Journal as part of the special issue, Don't Look Up, promoting leadership with resistance from below. So I'm very appreciative of this. I will share a PowerPoint presentation if I may, so hopefully I will be able to do it. <laughs> Just a second, let me see. Okay, let's start here. I'm new for editing, so. Okay, says that it is. Okay. Ah, oh, perfect. Okay, somehow is. I think. Can you all see it? Because I can only see it part of it. <laughs> uh, well, now now you minimized it, but before it was great. Uh, so if you just okay. yeah, just enlarge it, and it will be okay. Start from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. I cannot see anything. Just my presentation now, but it's fine. So um. So I titled this, and I also titled the, the opinion piece as From Margins to Power, a Resistance Leadership by Brazilian Women's Collective Candidacies. Um, I am, a, so I'm, I am a Brazilian citizen, and I am also a proud feminist uh, leadership scholar. And my key interest is in research and practice always lied around the study and, and, and working with women's collaborative experiences and, and, and practices. And, and this has been my passion, and this is one of the reasons that I also focus in looking at how women have been organizing as a Brazilian in my country, but also in different communities. And for me, I've always been very eager to really sh explore more and getting to know and, and, and hopefully amplify the voices and the representation and of Global South theory and practices. So from especially in the, the field of critical leadership, uh, literature and studies. And um, what I've seen, we know that there are many voices that have been calling for that, um, for amplifying the realities and theory and practice of Global South. And uh, because we do know that we are still grappling with the issues of representation, there's still first century and on, on that North, right? The predominantly showcases the white global North and male perspective. And while this specific work 
is not a traditional research article format, is, a, is an opinion piece. Um, I was very uh, careful and meticulous in really trying to gather data that uh, would provide reliable information, such as using, you know, Brazilian uh, government websites and um, the web of juntas, which I just figured out that while reviewing this presentation that is not available anymore, but I, I have downloaded, you know, several informations for that. And we can find this still a lot in social media, and blogs and newspaper about collective candidacies in Brazil, but also about juntas. And there's a, a variety of rich insights of diverse Brazilian research about the topic that it's worth it to read it uh, more and more being published in English. So for this specific um, uh, paper, I look at collective candidacies, but focus on the realities of Juntas, which is a collective from the northeast of Brazil, which I am I'm from there, from the area of Brazil. And my idea was to really delve a little bit about what are collective candidacies and specifically what is Juntas and what they've done it and, and how they exemplify resistance leadership. Uh, as a political movement transitioning people from the margins of society, from community-based work uh, to the to center, to the power of political um, stars in Brazil. And I brought this, this image because I think, uh, you know, I, I imagine this is not representative of Brazil, of course, but it's an image that is always shocking me. And I always connect this idea of this the lingering uh, legacy, colonial legacy that we have in Brazil, and they have these deep roots and, and, and entrenched the social, political and economic inequalities. Uh, they have been perpetuating discrimination against women uh, and various marginalized groups in Brazil, particularly black communities, LGBTQ plus communities, right, and indigenous communities and, and among others. But despite all that, this structure of challenges that we face in Brazil, I think it's crucial, it's important, and it's mandatory that to, we need to highlight and underscore that Brazil has this vibrant history of diverse social movements, from unions uh, to you know, left-wing parties, um, community-based social movements. They have a his history of mobilizing, um, mobilizing people to confront those systemic systems of oppression that have been affecting people for their whole lives. And this is really a political resistance movement that has been traditionally focused on established um, collective action and democratic participation of people. And we, what we do have seen is that during those um, intense attacks to our democracy and our human rights, um, we have seen people emerging from um, everywhere, from all, uh, areas of society, but especially from the margins, and reframing that popular and collective action to denounce this uh, uh, oppression, right? And and we've seen uh, not uh, a while ago with Bolsonaro and the before it, 2018 with, with Dilma impeachment and everything, that our political landscape has changed dramatically with the ascent of um, conservatism, fundamentalism, ultra-religious parties. And coupled with the election of Bolsonaro in 2018, it really um, stimulate people to create more incentives and, and fortify a more robust and creative movement where people get together to, to resist. And uh, talking about uh, the previous administration, right? We have uh, what we had in, from 2019 to 2022, and I imagine you uh, all have read news about it and um, many stories that included those systemic attacks to our democracy, to um, human rights, to indigenous rights. And, and, and this is one of the scenarios that before in the year of 2018, the numbers of collective candidacies um, for social justice, because it's important to uh, mention that collective candidacies, they emerge from um, left and right and center, but the, the ones that emerged and we've used the use of social media and everything else, they uh, emerge with more creativity in a sense that we need to resist to this. We cannot, uh, we need to create more spaces from long silence people 
women, indigenous people, black, the Quilombola community, which is a racial ethnic group that uh, originates directly from slave people who resisted Brazilian slavery. And so those spaces, uh, with the ascent, of course, of the conservatives, emerged to resist those. And what we have been seeing is new representation, a new representation of diverse voices and diverse systems. But we have to remember that the history is deep. The, the historical inequalities in our countries are deep. And when we look at this picture, for example, um, is we, what we can see is this deep, still underrepresented um, picture that you can see just a few people representing the diversity of Brazil. So while we are a population with 51.1% of women, 46% being black and 0.83% being indigenous. When we look at our national corridors or the deputy, um, this is a picture of the National Congress of uh, Deputies, the Chamber of Deputies. What you see is, well, we don't even see here, but we only have a 70% of women, a 0.26% are black, uh, and 0.9 to 7 indigenous, we do have two transgender women, but Brazil's diversity is still widely underrepresented in the politician and political institutions. And even we can say the scraps of representation that we have uh, in our local and national um, Congress and, and, and chambers are the results of social justice groups and uh, fighting for generations to achieve that participation. Um, it's also important to say that um, we've seen a huge increase of different ways to reorganize. And although collective candidacies are not a new thing, they exist in Brazil since the 1994, um, what we do see is that there are new ways of organizing, there are new ways of showing their faces and showing how they want to uh, Brazil be a fair and more represented, to have a fair and more representative political system. And what we see here as pictures of social movements that became um, became the illustration of resistance practice from the margins uh, when they start to create those innovative collective campaigns and share a widespread um, um, groups. Uh, and, and we can see here, there's a Bancada Activista, which is uh, the feminist caucus in Sao Paulo, uh, feminist collective that support women in politics. Uh, the Quilombo in Parliament, which is a campaign with was 120 uh, candidates like linked to the black movement. The Bancada Cocao, Bancada Indigena, which is a, uh, um, a movement of indigenous people that had a campaign with uh, 30 indigenous candidates seeking that seats on, on National Congress and seating, see, seeking to amplify the voices and the demands of indigenous people. Uh, my vote will be feminist, meu voto será feminista, with women that have been integrated from all parts of Brazil to all areas of Brazil, uh, and end up by supporting more than 230 feminists. campaign with candidates uh, who declared themselves as part of the community or a vote, I vote black women. So it was a variety of new um, movements that they have been out there for a while now and been working, organizing, working in community base, but they really start to amplify their voices, especially with the use of social media, uh, when they saw that movement and ascent of conservative and in our country. So they communicate that really go and their campaigns, they communicate the goals of they want to, to balance that political game. They want to focus on collaboration instead of that matter of competition among themselves. They want to push uh, aside those uh, habitual government structure, individualism and, 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 and the white male, Brazilian male. And they want to bring this representation more consistent with the faces and the bodies, the diversity of the Brazilian population. So uh, collective candidacies, as I mentioned, is not a, a new thing in Brazil. And although um, the Brazilian electoral system only uh, recognized one person as the official 
office holder for, for in collective candidacies. And what happened is that, um, well, those people in the movement, they get together and they create a campaign. And that campaign, they say, we are going to work from our communities and we're going to work from the real needs of, of our communities. And we are going to um, be a mandate together. We're going to work together and we're going to occupy that seat together. But unfortunately, the uh, Brazilian electoral system still does not recognize that collective representation in one seat. To this, And so what they do is they campaign. The campaign is acceptable. So the Brazilian electoral system, OK, you can do your campaign. You can promote your candidacy, um, your collective candidacy. But at the time for voting, what we'll have is the name of the speaker person for you, which is, for example, for Juntas was Jo. Jo was uh, the speaker person for the collective. And by your side, by your name, we'll have Jo of Collective Juntas. So Collective Candidates is a promoter with one call candidate's name alongside with the official name. But during the campaigns, they are campaign as a collective they say okay although only one person can officially occupy that electoral seat the campaign we have promised that we are going to do this mandate as a collective one and so they promote that and they try to really uh, explain what is it and more and more in brazil we know that right it's been a while that this has happening and um and people still have some questions about it but um, the majority of people that are in supporting, they know that those, those are the movements, those are the people that have been supporting their, their, their community for a while. So uh, there are some initiatives that have been proposed in National Congress to change legislation and to make, uh, to recognize the collective uh, as occupying the seat. Because at the time that we, uh, they are in Congress, so they are in um, city council, um, only this focus person, in this case, Joe, would be the one to formally, to officially represent the, the collective there. So um, it's important also to say that one of the few challenges in not being recognized by that is that you will need to have some kind of agreements, right? The uh, to say, okay, how are we working here? So uh, usually what happened is that elected collective holders, they operate based on formal and informal agreements. Some of the formal says, okay, we go to a notary and those, those are the agreements that we have as collective and this is how we're going to function in our collective decision-making process. And others, they do it as informal agreement. But they always make sure to clarify during the campaigns that they uh, are working together and they bring those different minds and bodies to collaborate in specific areas to, to attend better the community needs and to share responsibilities equally and to share the decision making process in case of juntas they share everything included uh the salary of the focus person would be shared by by all members of um, of the Juntas Collective, and I think it's um so the the uh, data from the government declared that uh, has been out and saying that self-declared Black people are currently the most involved in this candidacy modality and has been gaining uh, more space. Uh, in the in the Brazilian political um, scene and, and environment, and this you really illustrate a piece of history that we know in Brazil that Black women have been producing insertions against dominant models of promoting um, and promoting uh, those um, narratives of dispute and dissent and resistance, and and. By then, other Brazilian feminist women, such as indigenous and poor women in community, who are emerging as powerful protagonists of this new type of resistance, political leadership in the country, and then moving people and representation and voices from the margins of the formal politic, just because they have been doing politics informally their whole lives and, and in their communities, to the center of formal political power in Brazil. So um, those uh, collective candidacies um, for social justice, they really focus on the rights of workers, women's and girls and indigenous people, 
and uh, the overlapping rights relating to the, the you know the main needs of our population which involve educational universal health care the environment economy culture and and security matters too and so what they are bringing here is um issues and and that there are intersectional issues that are marked by the inequalities of gender, race, class, and sexuality. And they are bringing that to the center, really, of their talk, and they are really bringing it to the center of their walk because they, they are really walking what they're saying. They are taking actions from campaign through when they are in the period of their mandate. And so looking at the literature, you can really see how juntas and collective candidacies in general, they are resisting uh, that while male centric practice of traditional political rights, and they are resisting this romanticized idea of leadership and this romanticized idea of the nationalized, right, the power symmetries and that idea of one leader, one, one identity, one, one seat in this case, right? And they are doing this by introducing this new intersectional and collaborative political practice. So they include the representation of those marginalized voices uh, and profiles to form a politics, and they really democratize right, the spaces and the decision-making process. Um, uh, and they always are, they are promising and they are walking the talk to talking about we want to legitimize uh, our participation and legitimize that we, we need to focus on the needs of our society, the needs uh, of, of our communities. So um, Juntas is a collective, is a collective candidacy who became a mandate and was a mandate for 2018 to 2022. And they are one of the first collective candidacies form, formed exclusively by women in Brazil. And I picked Juntas because um, a lot of the majority of the collective candidacies, they are um, in locating more in the south, southwest, southwest of Brazil, and and the northeast. Um, there's a uh, there's a, a, a huge difference in in regards to economic difference between the south and the north and the northeast per se. And juntas have been formed by those amazing five women who have been working uh, in different communities and they were brought together and they represent these witnesses of personal and social political back background of resistance in Brazil. Jo Cavalcanti, which was the name who was officially recognized uh, next to Colectivo Juntas for, um, for, for by the Tribunal of uh, Electoral Tribunal in Brazil. Um, Jo Cavalcanti was a former street vendor and activism for the movement of homeless uh, workers. Carol Vergolino was a journalist and uh, was no is they all are in cultural activism. Joel Macarla is um, a defender of public policies for youth and LGBT plus rights. Katia Cunha, uh, an activism for the rights of teachers and educational professionals. And Robiance Lima, a transsexual lawyer and activism for the rights of, of black and LGBTQ plus. IA plus. So they are uh, voice. They are voices. They are bodies, uh, and and they are um, what represents the image of the diversity also in in Brazil. So you know, learning about juntas and and the collective, we you can really see how they how they organized um, and how they built resistance leadership practices. Uh, and, and that really represents that movement from the margins to, to power. And they are women from community-based movements of resistance, and they really enact that alternative power relations. They really focus on rebalancing power relations, and their narrative was this, and their actions were that. And they create this innovative political campaign and they create this platform to challenge directly. Their narrative was about challenging individualism in politics. It was about doing politics with a feminist agenda and process. It was about destabilizing that established political leadership dominance and the existing power relations um, because they are not serving to the real needs of the communities. And they want to generate that change via plural voices and bodies 
in the 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 seat the, the government right and the rooms and the seats of power in the government and uh, there's this powerful um uh, quote from carol vergolino uh called call parliamentari which is called was a co-candidate and she says we are a collective mandata because we are feminists we come in to tear up this political system and to say that politics can happen in another way so we invert the linguistic logic which was would be collective man mandado mandata uh, and we bring this idea of collectivity and which in which everything will be decided together so um, what we can really see here is that their narratives um, were in practice before they uh, gained the seat during their campaign when they were really uh, generating spaces for so those plural voices uh, would be challenging SATA school of individual political power and they would be concentrating addressing the needs of the most vulnerable people. And they went to the streets and they went to the communities and they talked to people and they included uh, people to create uh, uh, what is the program, what is our plan when we get to that seat. And they have several meetings and assemblies with collectives and social movements, and they work together on those proposals and to really respond to the priorities. And when they got the seat uh, um, and they got elected with 40,000 uh, votes, um, they uh, continue that, right? And they continue to practice power from and by people. Um, their cabinet was formed by representatives of many social uh, movements, 34 people, 68% women, 50% black, 41% uh, youth, 41% uh, uh, in, in, in the majority of the LGBT and 1% with uh, a disability. And they recognize or say, we need, we need to make sure that we are involving the social movements because we are declaring since the beginning that our relations are of insomnia, dialogue, horizontality, and transparency. And this is a movement to legitimize the power of people in politics. Uh, and so we need to locate those the variety of social justice agendas and the struggles of communities and identify where they intersect and how can we shape the way that we're going to work for our community. So, and during the mandate, they continue to do that. They continue to bring the participation of people in the voices to the formal political uh, uh, sites and spaces, and 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 they continue to collaborate to create work actions. And they did having making sure to gain that space where people could amplify their voices in public hearings and political plenary sessions and public seminars and in the direct participation of proposing new laws. And uh, of course, there was resistance, uh, you know, because you're a lot of the politicians in Brazil, especially traditional way to do politics is, OK, I go during my campaign and I made all those narratives but people are not, they do not come, they are not part of uh, public hearings, the majority, right? And then all plenary sessions, but they had, they had to stand the participation of communities and social movements there. And, and there was some conflict, there was some lack of recognition, especially in regards to the lack of um, um, support to collective candidacies. Uh, and collective mandates. And, and there, during the mandate, uh, juntas really created and nurtured that democratic and transparent communication amongst the sectors of civil society and Brazilian authorities. And they make sure you will listen to what we have to say and we, you know, we will create that space. So we can see here for the features, a lot of uh, uh, um, audiencias publicas which were, you know, those public hearings that people were there and they're occupying these spaces. And so the focus of Junta was really about humanizing public policies um, and not just saying, but, you know, walking their walk and doing, working for access to public education and health, their public security policies, representing workers from the informal market, which is, is a huge thing in Brazil, uh, working investments for culture, working uh, more accessibility policies, assets to land, um, and bringing together that integration of the environment, agroecology and food security, defending the rights of uh, the housing and the people and house people, LGBTQ plus rights and the rights, of course, of the indigenous peoples in, in Pernambuco. 
uh, who found a, a space to really amplify their voices and needs. And those are just uh, sayings that what Juntas has said. They said they are there to strengthen people's power, open these spaces to amplify that plurality of voice demands and then denunciations during those political scenarios. So people would go there even during COVID and they would open that space. And, and they declare openly that leadership for them was not isolated, but it was shared in different levels and with a flow to debate and decision contemplating to make up that mandate. So this is what that mandate was about. It is about creating those decision-making spaces, what projects would be collective debated. And when decisions were reached, um, everyone knew what decisions had been made and which instances those decisions have been made. Because we do know when we uh, debate in collaboration, it can take a long time in the decision-making process, you know, you have to advance. So the members of the group also um, had to make some decisions, reach some decisions, but also making sure that they would explain and they would say, okay, this is the reason why, how we became and we came here, the instances of our decisions. So for that collaborations uh, and, and for direct popular participation, uh, they created this shared leadership practice and they were able to uh, create, put out there several laws, uh, amendments, and, and projects, especially projects, uh, you know, concerning the violations of our uh, community in Pernambuco. So, um, just looking at the literature too, um, we can see how the literature of resistance leadership is already talking about all of that, but with this uh, example of juntas and collective candidacies, we can see that in practice, right? We can see that resistance leadership countering preventing narratives of one person will be the acquiring power, manifesting leadership, empowering as a process uh, with several people in collective decision making process. And that is really about um, a collective emerging to transform those relations of domination and power in society. And they did, they did bring structural challenges uh, and, chance, and changes to the political arrangements in Pernambuco and in local level. And they really questioned um, through that practice, that individual leadership practice, uh, and especially the interests of neoliberal systems and uh, that we're not working to lift uh, Brazil from oppressed communities, right? Um, getting to almost the end, so, you know, in Brazil we say, uh, not all the flores, not all the flowers, and, 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 and it was, uncertainties, there was insecurities, there was conflicts uh, surrounding the experiences. Um, there's not much that I could find on it, and I hope to continue to look at that if I decide also to uh, spend a little bit uh, to a more research, formal research project on this. But uh, one of the main reasons that have been declared is for the difficulties and securities and uncertainties in that process and in um, and among juntas, it was the absence of proper regulation to legitimize the collective holding uh, an elective office, right? They did the collective candidacies. You still do not have this um, a formal recognition. There's a still one name that goes as the speaker's person and the other uh, members of the collective uh, could not occupy certain spaces that they should have the right to be, but they were not um, accepted or not gave this space because of legislation. So Juntas expressed that there are no winning formulas and, uh, and, and you know, it's not an easy path and there's no guarantees in this path um, to create a success of collective process. But the main advice here is to really collectives have to have a, uh, all members of the collective have to have a concrete in common horizon um, um, and you know those shared values are important so how they find a way to uh, sustain the work together right because they know the adversities will come they know there will be challenges on their path and they can obviously that collective path so um, it has been they have published uh, a manual uh, explain a little bit their trajectory and their stories and, and a little bit their advice as to what they have achieved um, for the first year, for example, and, and how advices for new co-candidates, right? And especially focus on how 
explicit and transparent to those collective candidates have to be to society. And this is what they've done it through their mandate because they know this new way to organize, this new innovative way to do politics and to resist traditional and romanticized ways of politics bring extra responsibilities. And there's still a lot of insecurity for the, for the part of uh, Brazilian communities to you and the uh, population and see how legal is this, you know, because it's such an innovative model. So they stayed together until 2022 as the five original um, members. And in 2022, uh, well, for the elections, for re-election, three of them decided to run together, Katia, Jo, and Joelma. The other two members decided to move on uh, to um, different levels of politics as an individual campaign. And um, and it is, uh, and this, uh, I don't, I, I couldn't, share with you the reasons for, for what, but uh, collective candidacies have been also serving as platforms for uh, women to run for political seats. And, and this is something that when you have a specific agenda, um, some have decided to you know, move um, from a different path. So for 2022, what happened is they did not get reelected. Uh, and um, one of the explanations behind that is 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 really system wide, right? There's significant increase in popular vote for conservative and far right candidates, not only Pelabuk, but all over Brazil. We did win the seats for president. Lula won elections, but you could really see this spread of uh, of local votes for conservative, for ultra religions, for far right candidates in a local, you know, in local levels, and this had a especially a negative impact uh, in elections all over the country, and especially in collective initiatives for social justice. Um, I think it's really important to look past this failure, right, at re-election um, to recognize how they are an innovative example of an intersectional uh, uh, resistance leadership practice, and it, they are a unique model for future movements. They have paid the way for other collective movements. Preta Juntas here below the picture, a uh, new women's collective, uh, the Wana uh, City Council seat, they're young black women uh, in that seat. And they have, uh, Juntas have planted the important seed, right? That inspire the women's collectives. And they have inspired candidacies, individual candidacies to also focus on social justice. Um, they are this innovative intersectional model. Um, they have legitimized by the practice, uh, the presence and the impact, the huge and tremendous impact of a, a range of different bodies and voices in political, uh, formal political spaces. And they, I do consider them a platform to be replicated uh, uh, around the world. They, they are multiples in Brazil and we can see more and more as I've heard for some feminists, um, um, friends around Latin America, that this is their desire also to try to replicate this idea. And they are, they are testament um, for, for the movement and they are testament that women have been organizing, have been resisting this conservative uh, ultra far right uh, movement and they are also changing in our societies. So uh, one of the reasons that I also wrote this paper was because I couldn't find a lot about the realities of uh, women and women in the global south and the literature of uh, critical leadership. And uh, for me, is this is you know this is a call for action too. I want this to be also uh, a way to you know people read this and say, okay, you know that let's foster some hope here, as nurturing the future of critical leadership studies. And I think drawing lessons from movements like this one can really advance critical leadership studies and can really encourage us to keep exploring, to keep looking what is out there, um, what is. Uh, and what is also the theories that can, you know, add value to cr critical leadership studies um, that we need to continue to have this openness, curiosity and uh, they go beyond the Eurocentric US centrism that we have in the literature of leadership and critical leadership studies. We need to continue to revisit theory and practice uh, concerning resistance movements and especially the resistance movement that are so active and they are in spaces that are really dangerous when they fight for uh, against far right authoritarianism in the global south. And um, I think it's really important for us as leadership scholars to 
collaborate more with practitioners um, and, and with scholars and activists in the global south because they are the ones right there. They are doing the work. They are studying there. They're exploring that. They're criticizing. They're fighting the status quo, and they have so much to offer um, to to the literature. And 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 I think my question also for all of us is like. Uh, what are other ways that we can implement varied and intersectional politics and leadership practice focus on social justice and the well-being of all people? Uh, here, uh, I'm in the United States, but there's also a global south within the United States here at the border uh, with uh, San Diego and Tijuana um, and, and, you know, in, in Europe back there, but also how can we look at the theory and practice of the global south uh, in a way to bring value and add value to what um, is the literature and is the practice in, in critical leadership studies. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate this space. So this is my contact um, for um, if if we'd like to continue the conversation. It is my plan to to um, maybe extend this paper and you know made it as a real full research paper. Um, I've I've been specifically interested in the idea of uh, well the collaboration right was uh, the challenges and opportunities for this type of collaboration and we know there are additional barriers for that and uh, um, uh, yeah the, all of the things with collaboration and and challenges and conflict what will happen because there are conflict there and and uh, it's important for us to explore that how can we make sure that we can nurture better those movements Thank you. Obrigada. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Carla. Um, I, I suppose you can stop sharing the, the screen now because I, I see myself in three places in the screen, which is not a good look. Uh, that's that much okay better now? view. That's much better view. Uh, well, thank you very much for this uh, uplifting presentation. And in the times where uh, spaces for for uh, kind of gender equality activism and research are being progressively obliterated or are shrinking. I almost forgot forgot what hopeful feels like. So thank you for reminding me of that important emotion that drives feminist activism. I will invite now uh, our audience to to um, raise hands or type in questions in the chat. Um, if you have any, although I appreciate that there was a lot to to absorb here, um, such a wonderful story. And uh, perhaps whilst I'm waiting for people to to kind of ruminate on, on this, because I'm slightly more familiar with the case, um, I'm happy to abuse my chairing responsibilities <laughs> and ask a question myself. So, as I said, this is a very uplifting case and uh, so uplifting that we almost forget that this kind of uh, collective leadership, re uh, resistance leadership, as, as you call it, um, unfolded against uh, the leadership of Bolsonaro. That is kind of, uh, that was the resistance against especially kind of predomin uh, predominantly white, uh, large homogenous, largely kind of right wing uh, political power that these women had to fight against. And I was wondering if you could tell us maybe a bit more um, about that kind of dynamics of, re of resistance of power, not just uh, not just women resisting this right wing kind of um, political landscape, but also I imagine those white, predominantly white men didn't wait passively, you know, that I imagine power resisted back. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit more about challenges that the juntas have encountered on the way to the office. Yeah. Well, I well the first challenge was institutionalized, right? The the the, the mainstream political system said, well, this is something that goes against what is our structure of power, right? One person, one seat, one individual. And for the numbers and for the image that I share, we can see that who has the power in Brazil are, are those, right? Those, but what is considered the white male in Brazil? And, and locally, they did face, um, you know, they faced bully during the one of their sessions because they said, well, um, um, 
other members, especially uh, you know the um, transgender man, uh, trans women, she was very much bullied because uh, her seat, well, her collective uh, participation. We said, well, this is not your place, right? So uh, I think that that was something. And a lot of was targeting identity too, right? There's, there's still a lot of target against women and, their, and how they identify and what they are. And the place, this is just the call for this is not your place. And I am justified for the fact that the legislation says this. So this was, was powerful, but hey, they resisted. They are there, so though this is our place. And although my name is not there uh, or as a spokesperson, but we are here, this is our cabinet, we build this. We have a history with our campaign. We have a history with our community. We have a collective agenda, and this is what we hear. This is our narrative. This is our practice. And, but they did, they suffered violence. There was, there was uh, instances that they have to go, you know, uh, file complaints against the police, because there was, there was a lot of bullying in regards to that. And this is um, something that also, can bring your motivation sometimes down, right? And then you say, okay, if and and I'm not really sure. I cannot really affirm with certainty that um, some of the members decided also to move through a different path and go for collect collective for individual uh, political seats besides their agenda. But it's not easy, you know. You're there. You don't see. You don't. You're you're not recognized for a specific system, but people recognize. And I think this is one of the narratives that Junta says, we are recognized by people. We are giving this power by people and people are sharing the power with us. It's the community power. And they were always saying about that. It's about Islamity, it's about collective, it's about everyone together. But it's it's the daily, it's, it's difficult, right? To, to, to when you're there with that seat in that spa space, is a different one, but they continue and they, they resist in, in that sense. But I, there was violence and violence, we know how they shape and they go against women. I imagine that's the that's the case, uh, which is why I, I asked the, that question. Violence is always around the corner when women uh, challenge power. Um, we have a question from Sersha first and then uh, a question from Melda. Sasha, I think you're muted. Ah, there you are. Yes, sorry, <laughs> my mic didn't turn on. Lovely presentation, and um, thank you so much for that. What I'm curious about is why is it that, despite suffering under Bolsonaro and other far right governments in South America, that women and minorities seem to have managed to form collectives and move forward, whereas in Europe we seem to be going backwards. I think it's really about surviving. It's really about, um, uh, you know, I've, I come from movements, from a women's movement in Spain. It's a powerful feminist movement and we do live in a space of a lot of privilege in Europe compared to spaces uh, that we have, you know, the, the the priorities are a little bit different sometimes. I mean, surviving, we're still fighting for our to survive for our lives in Europe and everywhere because women everywhere are trying to survive and to be alive and, and to defend their right to be alive in their communities. Um, but uh, the situation, at least in Brazil, got so insustainable. It was like, they are coming for us. They are killing us in daily lives because there is violence in this world, but they are coming for everything, for our rights to have access to health, for our rights to have access to education, for our access to even amplify our voices in some spaces. So um, I think what is happening in South America is those movements were always there, but the attack was so, the political was so against the life of everyone that were part of a specific uh, groups such as women indigenous blacks and you know, there was a direct attack to, to 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 diversity and to the right of equity in society that they they needed they needed to find new ways new creative ways to reorganize and to reinforce the movement um i think everywhere again everywhere we are, we, women are fighting for their lives but in south america there's some specific context there are just so intense and so uh, it's structural that uh, 
in order to survive, there's no other way. We need, we need to continue fighting. And of course, uh, um, a lot of other social movements getting together and bringing those agendas together, fortify the way that women are organizing. And sometimes I do see um, some movements that do not bring their agenda together uh, in European countries, or at least in Spain, because we all you know, have different agendas sometimes. So bringing those agendas together, bringing that collaboration together, bring those social movements and 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 fight for what's going to happen if we if we don't organize with Bolsonaro, for example, right? But what what that meant to Brazil was horrific, and we still see what he uh, his legacy ish, right? Because it really became it's not about him anymore, per se, but it's about the movement that he created and that he actually nurtured because it was just one part of that movement. Um, so I don't know if I answer your question. I don't know if I have a proper answer for that, but I, I do feel that priorities um, are a little bit different from, from, from different movements. Thank you. I mean, the only thing I would say, and I'm saying this is someone who is non-binary in the UK, I have no rights. I'm not recognized by the government. I do not exist. Yeah, things that uh, are becoming really, really properly grim um, here in, in Europe, everywhere around, around the world, but uh, perhaps very surprisingly around here because uh, we seem to have, we seem to be battling the same battles that have been won, uh, you know, times and times over in the past. So it's a bit disheartening, uh, which is what makes your presentation uh, really needed and and so welcome. Um, Melda um, was wondering about your paper. Oh, Carla is a bit froze. Uh huh. Everything. Oh, yeah, froze. I couldn't hear anything. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just heard what, said, what you said. That is, um, you know, what happened in Europe and in the battles that been battles and battles again. I mean, the battle for reproductive yeah. rights in the U.S. will happen, right? And uh, and the reproductive justice, because our, our group here, we are uh, talking that uh, the talk of reproductive rights that goes beyond reproductive justice. But what, what people can see, and uh, in my women's group here, is like, we are back to fight this battle again. Uh, I said, well, I hope we fight this battle again. And we add a little bit extra because we have been battled for reproductive rights and we need justice. We need reproductive justice for all. So how can we, you know, uh, battle that again and add that extra? But yeah, this, this seems to be the wave that in, in a lot of places we've battled the battles again. And I hope we, I think, it will continue, but I hope that this is, you know, having women motivated and working together, this is huge. And, and this, and I hope that the youth and young people <laughs> do not have to battle the battle, but uh, if we work yeah. together with them. It would be nice not to kind of leave that kind of legacy to, to younger people. Uh, uh, I, I'm aware we have another two minutes left in the session. Um, but I'm also, if I may cheekily squeeze an, another question, as someone who writes about uh, solidarity and is interested how solidarity can be enacted in practice, um, I'm wondering if you were privy to any kind of uh, discussions of junta, uh, you know, um, it, especially it is really kind of curious how they managed to reach consensus on so many issues and so quickly considering they come from very diverse and different groups so i was just wondering if you have any insight into that kind of dynamics can you tell us a bit about their solidarity process perhaps it's a huge question that obviously can't be packed in a minute but <laughs> yeah. Well, I haven't had the chance. I have I tried to contact them because I do if you know the idea to extend the paper is also to get those direct insights mm -hmm. and and um, and because you're not you know working as a collective together anymore, it's a little bit difficult. I've been trying to contact to see it because I really would like to have more insights in regards to that. I do know that they were women who already share paths in community-based movement. They already share spaces. And when you do share those spaces and you know each other, trust, you already have that path of trust, right? Trusting, I trust your agenda, I trust what we do, I see where we connect. Um, they connect also with their political 
uh, party in that sense, uh, being collaborating for political parties. So I think all those spaces that they occupy together and that they found the union of those different agendas and different Oops, and we got frozen again. Social. Well, luckily this is happening at the end of the session uh, and not at the beginning, I suppose. Um, I don't think, uh-huh. Uh, sorry, Carla, you, you cut out, uh, but coincidentally, we also ran out of time. Uh, so thank you so much again. Uh, this was such a pleasure. Uh, and obviously, we will see more of you in, in, in GOP. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to this chat. Uh, I know this has been a busy day at the Open University, so I really appreciate it. Therefore, even more. Um, have a lovely afternoon and Carla, may I just ask you to stay for just five minutes after just to catch up Absolutely. a bit. Thank you so much and I'm looking forward also to continue this uh, part of other conversations with you. I appreciate <laughs> the space. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. <laughs>